Welcome everyone. Thanks for attending this uh, information session about uh, applying for a Churchill Fellowship. Um, this session is uh, themed on the arts and we have a couple of uh, Churchill Fellows who are going to talk about their experiences shortly and I'll introduce them. My name is Adam Davey. I'm the CEO of the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust. Uh, we're based here in Canberra, Ngunnawal country. Um, I'm going to begin this information session with an overview of Churchill Fellowships, uh, what they're about, how you apply, and what we're looking for. Um, I would like to acknowledge Australia's First Nations people, the traditional custodians of this land, and to pay my respects to Elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, I'd also like to welcome uh, all Aboriginal uh, and Torres Strait Islander people watching this session, and to let you know that we have recently formed uh, an Indigenous Churchill Fellows Network, which is pretty exciting. Um, and we've got quite an active alumni there who are um, very keen to engage with potential applicants. So if that's you and you're interested, um, you can get in touch with the trust uh, directly about that network. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, you'll be able to submit questions via the Q&A function um, on Zoom. If you missed a chance or you think of something after this session, um, you can contact us contact us directly uh, via email or phone and the, those contact details are on our website and they're also on the last slide of my presentation. Um, you can also attend another session um, if you want to over the coming weeks. Um, I also want to acknowledge that it's been very difficult times uh, for all of us over the last couple of years with the COVID pandemic, uh, both Australia in Australia and globally. Um, and of course, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, unrest globally at the moment. Um, there's been a lot of disruption, uncertainty, uh, suffering and death related to COVID. Um, and I hope that you're attending this session with a positive mindset and a hopeful outlook. Um, we're certainly uh, looking at things positively uh, this year where we can. Um, now, I'm quite often asked, you know, where does the money come from for Churchill Fellowships? And, and that's a really good question. Um, when Sir Winston Churchill resigned as British Prime Minister uh, in 1955 at the age of 80, he'd served under five reigning monarchs. He'd survived three wars. He'd been a writer, an historian, a journalist, an adventurer, a painter. Uh, he'd won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1953. And so, as you can imagine, there was a widespread desire to honour Sir Winston Churchill and to uh, capture the essence of his public service, uh, his intellect, his inspiration and his, even his humour for generations to come. Uh, now, Sir Winston wasn't perfect, and you know you can read some insightful essays that we've had commissioned um, on our website that explore Churchill through a contemporary lens. But he certainly was someone who readily believed that anything was possible if you put your mind to it. And the greatest figures in history were those who made a contribution to public service and to their fellow countrymen. So when Prime Minister Menzies announced the news of Sir Winston's death to Australians in January 1965, he also announced at the same time a national fundraising event to establish the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust and therefore Churchill Fellowships. So um, there was a national uh, door knock appeal with over 220,000 Australians um, supported by the RSL uh, participating as collectors and with strong support um, from the community and from governments and businesses, uh, about 2.2 million pounds or about $4 million equivalent uh, was raised. And that uh, still stands as one of Australia's most successful fundraising events. Um, so that money is, is invested and we, we use the uh, proceeds or the returns on those investments uh, to pay for Churchill Fellowships. Plus we receive bequests and donations um, and support as well, which helps us award more fellowships each year. So the other question I, I get asked is, well, you know, what are the attributes of a Churchill Fellow? You know, who are you looking for? And I think, you know, at the end of the day, Churchill Fellows are people who are passionate and committed to a particular issue. Um, they want to learn, they want to share that knowledge, uh, across their communities um, to benefit Australia um, more broadly. So it could quite possibly be you. Uh, ultimately, Churchill Fellowships are an investment in people and, and obviously the issues are the topics of their fellowships. 
So it's important to understand that Churchill Fellowship is a unique and prestigious opportunity, and it's open to Australians from all walks of life. It's not an academic scholarship, so it doesn't matter um, if you've finished you know, high school or if you've got a PhD. That's, that's not important when it comes to a Churchill Fellowship. And it's also not a funding grant. So you'll find if you're successful with a Churchill Fellowship that it really is empowering and liberating. We invest in you to go overseas and undertake the project that you designed. We don't ask you to acquit every cent and give back every uh, cent unspent. That's not how it works. It's not just an overseas trip though, it's the start of a lifelong journey and a contribution to make Australia better. Now, Churchill Fellowship doesn't need to comprise formal research. Some people, that's what they, they, they do with their fellowship. They undertake quite a formal program of research, but you can learn new skills. Uh, you can build networks and observe best practice in your chosen field. The fellowship is for overseas travel uh, between four to eight weeks, taken in one continuous journey. We've awarded nearly 4,500 Churchill Fellowships since 1965, and each year we sort of aim for 100 or so Churchill Fellowships to be awarded across you know, every uh, topic and field that you can imagine. Um, Churchill Fellows travel across the globe on the widest range and depth of topics, and they bring back to this country you know, information, uh, projects, products, ideas, uh, innovations, which make this country So to be eligible for a church fellowship, you must be an Australian citizen, or as of this year, you can be a permanent resident of Australia, and you need to be over 18 years of age. Now, the ability to travel overseas is obviously essential, and we can provide support for you if you have a disability. Um, we also now offer virtual research options for people who cannot travel physically due to disability or caring responsibilities. Some people have asked the question about um, vaccines in relation to COVID. And I think the answer there is pretty clear that if the requirements of traveling uh, set by governments uh, here in Australia and other countries mean that you need to be vaccinated against COVID, then um, you would need to be able to comply with that. So our expectation is if you're applying for a church or fellowship, you're also willing to comply with, with having a passport and all other things that are required to travel overseas. Keep in mind, if you're successful this year, you won't be traveling until um, early 2023. So lots uh, can happen over the next 12 months and hopefully uh, traveling internationally continues to get easier and uh, as you know, freer like it was prior to COVID. For people living in remote parts of Australia, uh, we are going to be introducing something new, which is allowing domestic travel. And that's based on, on feedback we've had, particularly from the Northern Territory about the uh, relative challenges in traveling um, extensively and the, the relative benefits of traveling within Australia uh, and bringing knowledge back to remote communities. So if that's, again, if that's you, um, please get in touch with us to discuss. Now, Churchill Fellowship's an individual project. It's not a team project. So we quite often will get asked um, by, by people if they can apply as a team. And the short answer is no, you can't apply as a team. Um, there's only one person that's a Churchill Fellow. Now you can um, take someone with you if that's appropriate. So we have had cases where employees have paid to send a colleague um, with someone. A good example was a Victorian Fellow who was looking at uh, Indigenous cultural burning uh, and his employer sent an Indigenous employee with him on that fellowship. And that really added a lot of value, um, not only to the uh, the research overseas and the work they did, but when they came back, they've done a lot of work together implementing those findings. If you're undertaking tertiary studies, um, that's fine. However, your proposed project can't directly form part of that study. Um, the reason for that is we want you to commit 100% um, to your Churchill Fellowship project. Um, and you know you have to provide a report um, when you return and we expect you then to uh, continue working on implementing what you learned. So it's important though that you hear that a Churchill Fellowship is an opportunity for people from all walks of life. And that's, uh, I guess, a, a phrase that gets bandied around, but for us, that's really core to our being, that's our mantra. In terms of projects, uh, your project must be suitable for a fellowship and benefit the Australian community in some way. So you bring back and share knowledge or ideas or practices or skills. And I think um, if you think about this particular information session, we're talking about um, 
the arts more broadly. Um, that can that uh, what you bring back could be a cultural benefit, um, sharing your practice with people. Um, of course, that's not as tangible as, as a product or something, but uh, it's equally uh, valid in the eyes of a church or fellowship. So you must demonstrate um, to us when you apply that you've explored your topic fully in Australia uh, to really be considered. We don't want to send you overseas because you've identified that you could learn something overseas that you could actually learn already in Australia. So it's important that you're well aware of what's happening in Australia um, before you apply uh, to, to be paid to go overseas. The project must be a self-contained project. So it can't be part of a degree, as I mentioned earlier, but it also can't be partly funded by another organisation. Um, so we're not you know, an external travel budget for your um, project you're doing through your um, employer or other group. Um, a church or fellowship is a significant undertaking that you need to focus on fully. Uh, it doesn't need to relate to your employment. Um, it often does, and that's natural that people are drawn to um, work that, that they're excited about and they're passionate about, and, and that's fine. Um, if, if it is related to your work, your application for a fellowship, um, I'd recommend that you uh, find out from your employer, you know, how supportive they are of the idea of you going overseas um, for maybe, um, you know, four to eight weeks next year and, and be comfortable that, that you're going to be able to get leave or they might in some instances give you some paid leave. So they're good conversations to have at the point that you're applying. Now, we don't set limits on the topics or the issues that are being explored. That's really a, a strength of Churchill Fellowships. And you do um, design your own project. And I think that's the beauty of a Churchill Fellowship. If you can think of your topic, as I said, there's no limits. Um, and it's up to you to convince us um, why what you're doing is important and why you need to go to various countries and, and to meet different people and different organisations. So that, that's your job, convince us. Um, we do offer some sponsored fellowships. So as I said, we try and award 100 or so fellowships each year. Um, we have some generous individuals and in some cases organisations who agree to fund each year um, additional fellowships on particular topics. So in the case of the arts, we actually have um, a couple that come to mind, the Bob and June Prickett um, Churchill Fellowship, specifically for excellence in um, the visual arts. And Bob himself was a Churchill Fellow and He's um, no longer with us, but he, he left a bequest to the trust. And so we award fellowships in his name. And he particularly uh, was keen to support the arts. And in fact, Bob uh, himself um, was a marble sculptor. Uh, we've also got the Stuart and Norma Leslie um, Churchill Fellowship for performance excellence in the arts. And so that's another one that, um, you know, is particularly available for, for people in the arts. Um, what I would mention to you is when you apply, you'll have the option of selecting um, one of these sponsored fellowships, but that won't impact on you being considered for a church or fellowship more broadly. Effectively, that just helps us um, quickly identify suitable uh, applicants to allocate to these sponsored fellowships. But it's good to know that there are some additional fellowships for the arts um, on offer this year. So when you're um, uh, framing your project, I think it's important to ask itself yourself the question, um, how will my proposed project be of some benefit to an aspect of Australian society? So it's okay if you benefit um, personally, it just can't be completely self-serving. You need to think about how we share those learnings um, with your community. So as you'd expect, you apply online, applications are open until the 28th of April, and you apply um, through our website. You can go on there and register. Um, it's an electronic form that you can uh, save and come back to many, many times until um, the closing date. Uh, if using the application form is a barrier for you um, through disability or some other reason, uh, please get in touch with, them, uh, with us and let us know because the last thing, thing we want is someone to not be able to apply simply because they couldn't fill out the form that we created for them. So um, that's important uh, for you to hear as well. Um, remember that you're competing against all other applicants. So think about how you're going to convince the selectors uh, to invest in you and your project um, idea. You're going to need two references, and this is important. Uh, one reference that can vouch for you and your personal qualities and someone else who can uh, vouch for your particular topic. So someone who's an expert or well-regarded in your field. 
And I would highly recommend you engage them early. One of the biggest uh, issues that applicants have each year at the closing date is they haven't factored in time for their referees to undertake their um, reports. And they might be overseas or you know, on, on a boat or away or whatever it might be. So I'd highly recommend that you think about who could be your referees and approach them as soon as you can and make sure that they'll be available before the 28th of April to fill out their, um, their refer reference for you. And that's done electronically through the form as well. Uh, Churchill Fellows tell us time again that the process of filling out the application form, it's challenging because there's a limited number of words you can use, you have to be succinct, but also that process um, of, of filling out the form helps them distill their whole project and their ideas and get really focused. So again, um, get in touch with potential referees early and log in and start your application early so you can see all the questions, you can start focusing on how to frame your application. Um, the form is fully all automated. It'll take you through what you need to do. And if you don't fill out something, it'll tell you that you can't proceed until you've filled it out. Um, don't leave it to the last minute is the best advice there. It won't be your best application. Now you will be asked to um, put an itinerary in your application. So limit your itinerary to destinations that will be of most benefit to your project. Overcrowding your itinerary can lead to fatigue and maybe of less benefit to the overall project. So we do expect that you'll put some fat into your itinerary. So for example, you might say, uh, you might plan to go and visit an organization in, I don't know, New York, um, and you think, oh, look, that'll be two days. Don't, don't leave it at two days. Put in a couple of extra days either side because there may be meetings you didn't know you're gonna have. And someone says, oh, why don't you go and meet with this person? And if you're shooting out um, to another city or another country, the very next day, you're not going to get a chance to take up those opportunities. We expect you to, uh, you know, uh, get to enjoy the culture of the countries you're in, and to get to have weekends uh, and actually enjoy the experience so that you make the most of it. So don't make your itinerary too jam packed. Um, it's important to put forward a complete itinerary um, at the point of application to make sure you include the countries you wish to visit because we use that information to assess and to ultimately cost your fellowship. So you need to be uh, quite specific, but you don't need to have contacted the people and the organisations to say, hey, look, I might be coming, you know, and, and try and lock those meetings in. Um, we just expect you to know who you want to meet with, what you think you're going to get out of those meetings and how you're going to do it. So you might say that, you know, you're going to do some observation, you're going to have meetings, you might be undertaking a course. Um, one bit of advice is don't um, try and frame your Churchill Fellowship application around attending a conference, because that's really not the purpose of a Churchill Fellowship and that's not going to be a strong application. If there is a conference that just happens to be on that you think you might better work into your overall project, that's acceptable, but don't make your application all about the conference because you're not going to get through uh, this competitive process that way. Um, just a little bit about COVID. Um, you know, we have had now um, our first Churchill Fellow leave Australia uh, last week, uh, first person who's travelled for us uh, in, the, in a couple of years, which is pretty exciting. And we've got more Churchill Fellows leaving over the next couple of weeks. So travel is starting to become possible uh, and a little bit easier and a little bit more predictable. Uh, with the Churchill Fellowship, we provide funding for your fares, um, for your accommodation, uh, for your food, living allowances, um, and also we provide insurance. So we do have travel insurance that um, covers you as well. In terms of the selection process, uh, we have panels and committees in each state and territory comprising people from across a range of different fields and sectors. So applicants, our applications will be shortlisted and then there'll be interviews. If you're in New South Wales or Victoria, you might get a first interview and then if you get through, you'll get to a second interview. In the other states, there's just one round of interviews and that's due to the, the numbers of applicants um, based on the populations. Um, interviews are held to determine who will be recommended for a fellowship. And we generally prefer people to attend face-to-face, -face, but again, with the various vagaries of COVID and things that can change, we can accommodate video interviews as well. If you look on our website, you'll see that the, there is a timeline that shows you when interviews are proposed to be held. That's already been set. About half of applicants who make it to an interview or to the final interview in some cases uh, will be um, likely to get a fellowship. So if you get to an interview, it's a pretty big result um, and you've got a good chance of getting a fellowship. 
Um, but it is a competitive process. Not everyone who's interviewed will get a fellowship. Recommendations are then um, reviewed by our board in, in uh, mid-September, and then we'll make the announcement and successful applicants will be able to travel in early 2023. We're often asked for tips uh, about the application process, and uh, the best tips I can give you are to read and address the selection criteria, use as little jargon as possible. So our selection committees and panels will have people from a range of different fields and expertise on there, but they might not know exactly the intricate details of what you're talking about. So don't assume that knowledge, um, use plain English and um, be succinct. So uh, finally, remember it is a very competitive um, process, but that's not a reason to chicken out. Um, you know, you've got to have a little bit of self-confidence. And um, if you're thinking about it and you've made it to this um, webinar, then I think, you know, you're halfway there. You should follow through on your instincts and, uh, and have a look at an application. So don't be shy. Um, you will be competing against everyone else who lodges an application. Uh, and most of them are going to satisfy the selection criteria. So you need to really make your, your idea and your project um, stand out. You, got, you need to sell yourself. So on that note, um, here's our contact details. Uh, phone number for the office. They've got a small team here in Canberra and everyone's very friendly and happy to answer your questions. You can go to our website, you can read reports from other fellows, you can search via keyword um, to find other uh, fellows uh, on similar topics to yours. And um, that's it for me. I'm now going to introduce our first uh, speaker, um, Deb Weiss. Oh, sorry, I've just been informed there's a change of order. So Paul Tunzi, um, Paul uh, was awarded his Churchill Fellowship in 2017 and Paul's from uh, Western Australia. Uh, he's a master piano technician here and he visited Europe to investigate advanced conservation techniques and the maintenance of historical keyboard instruments. So on that note, welcome Paul, thanks for coming today and I'll hand over to you. Hi, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Good. Um, is my mic on? Yep, you're all good, Paul. I can hear you. We can see your presentation. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, my name is Paul Tunzi. I'm a piano technician in Western Australia. Um, I take this with the most um, overwhelming honour and privilege to be able to present um, my Churchill that I went on 2018. My Churchill Fellowship was on the restoration or the preservation of historical keyboard instruments. This took me to the motherlands of the invented piano that we know over the last 300 years, that is Florence and um, Vienna and London, along with uh, 25 cities. Uh, my recommendation is don't do what I did. <laughs> 25 City was a lot to cram in in a period of time, but I had justification for saying 25 cities. Um, and the reason for that is because my story started when I was 10 years old. Uh, the picture on the left shows the original store that I learned my craft from. Obviously I wasn't alive when there was a T-model Ford out the front. <laughs> um, but the, um, when I was 10 years old, I wanted to be a piano technician. And I was one of the last um, in Western Australia to have the opportunity uh, to have a traditional master apprentice style training. This training though, um, allowed me over the 40 years of being a piano technician um, to consider something very important for the sake of creative arts. So my Churchill um, Fellowship gave me the opportunity to research the holistic approach required to preserve the integrity of the culturally significant keyboard instruments that we have here in Western Australia and around Australia. But essentially it was going to be who will maintain the acoustic instruments for the next generation of music makers and where and how are these potential tuner technicians going to be trained. The issue that we have around the world, with the exception of only a few countries, but definitely here in Australia, 
is there is now nowhere to learn how to be a piano technician in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, no appropriate place. Um, and this has been an ongoing issue now, as you can see, this man, uh, James Boyk in 1995, made um, comment that um, piano technicians are in fact um, disappearing very, very quickly. I'm a member of the Heritage Crafts Association in UK and Prince Charles is the president of the association and each year they formulate a list of crafts throughout the UK which are in serious um, um, state of disappearing. And they, they class these crafts as uh, criti critically endangered um, and no longer being practiced in the UK. This also applies to Australia. They might include crafts with a shrinking base of craftspeople, crafts with limited training opportunities, and crafts with low financial viability, or crafts that actually have no mechanism to pass on the skills and knowledge. The elite piano technician is in fact one of those crafts that are now disappearing um, at a rapid rate, with the majority of piano technicians in Australia now, elite piano technicians now in their late 60s, early, early 70s. As a concert technician, we're quite often called the silent or unseen artisan. Their function is in fact to prepare an instrument for any use um, to allow the artist to perform at their full potential. One of the reasons why our craft disappears is because we in fact disappearing, sorry, is because we're in fact being too silent for too long. I applied for a Churchill Fellowship to discover not only how to preserve historical instruments, but more so who's going to be looking after them in the future. The Churchill opened doors that I could never ever possibly imagine. Um, one of the very first door that was open for me was in fact Buckingham Palace. I was welcomed into Buckingham Palace by the chief um, senior curator of the Royal Collection and the man also commissioned to look after the Queen's instrument. You can see here the gold instrument is very famous for different reasons, including made for Queen Victoria. Uh, the bottom right hand side picture shows it was used in um, the um, Royal Proms a couple of years ago. Uh, as a side note, I was flown over to be the associate technician for this because, again, UK have run out of um, suitably experienced skilled technicians to be able to look after a concert instrument. I said I'd go providing that took back all the rabbits, but they didn't. Um, the piano, <laughs> the, my Churchill took me to all the birthplaces of the piano, starting also in Florence and throughout the UK. I was privileged to be able to, um, as I said, have doors open to me uh, because of my Churchill um, Fellowship to see some of the world's most significant instrument collections, including Vienna. Vienna is the home of the Kunsthistorics Museum that has possibly one of the world's greatest historical collections. Amsterdam was another place that changed my life because it has, another, again, an important um, collection of historical instruments, as well as Paris. Part of preserving instruments is actually preserving the originality of the instrument. Here in the fourth, um, we get front of the screen, you see Bach's original harpsichord. That's now an important artifact. So we don't restore it, we don't repair it, we don't um, do anything to it. In fact, what we do is now replicate it instead and behind the screen, you'll see the replicated instruments. This is one of the most valuable instruments in the world. Um, it was um, been in the same family now since 1640 and the man inspecting it is uh, now uh, the offspring of the original owners. Um, it was built by Rookers in Antwerp, and the casework is actually adored with, um, painted with Rubens. So very, very valuable instrument. He's now, um, it's now in um, Amsterdam for research. As I said, I got to see some of the most gorgeous instruments around Europe um, because of the Churchill that opened these doors for me. 
Some instruments were wild. <laughs> some instruments have um, other functionality other than just being a piano um, that um, gave me opportunities to see. As you can see, pianos are not necessarily just pianos. Um, I got also to see the workshops around Europe, how instruments are restored. Most importantly, I got to meet some of the most remarkable people in UK and Europe um, who um, helped me and assisted me and, as I said, welcomed me with open arms because of the Churchill. I got to be, spend some time in some of the most remarkable workshops also throughout Europe. I got to play some of the instruments that these famous um, composers uh, owned or played as well. When I returned, I had an enormous amount of um, support and encouragement from all sorts of places and in museums, including Buckingham Palace. This has allowed me to develop further relationships. So on the bottom right hand, you see a young girl from Perth who's going to be commissioned to repolish the French polish of the dining room tables of Windsor Castle. This is all due to the opportunities afforded me by the Churchill. When I got back, Someone said to me before I left, be prepared for your world to change. I never graduated Sunday school, but when I got back, I found myself with a posing question. I didn't find the answer I was looking for in Europe or UK, and that is where are the next generation of piano tuners coming from? The Vice Chancellor of Edith Cowan University then gave me a scholarship to do my masters and researching the piano that came to Australia on the first fleet. This has now been upgraded to a PhD. And I've got to say, whoever advised me at the time that my world would change, they had no idea what they meant. It's given me opportunities to express what I do and talk about what I've achieved because of my Churchill um, in different venues around Perth and Australia. Most excitingly, I'm now doing a PhD on essentially replicating myself. These 12 participants um, and the next generation, potentially next generation of piano technicians. And I'm very proud to say that at least four of them are going to replace me within the next several years, hopefully. Um, this will, a Churchill Fellowship has the potential literally to change your world and literally the world around you. Um, don't hesitate, go for it. Um, who would have thought that uh, four years ago, uh, a craft that was essentially diminishing under my feet in my own lifetime has changed my world to the point where I'm now a PhD candidate trying to replicate myself and my craft for the sake of music making in Australia. Thank you very much for listening and participating. If you have any questions later on, I'm more than happy to answer for you. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, uh, Paul. He's obviously an overachiever, uh, we can tell. Um, I now would like to uh, introduce Deb Weiss. Deb is from uh, Tasmania, the Hobart-based artist. She received her Churchill Fellowship in 2017. Uh, Deb visited European botanical collections from French expe expeditions to Tasmania to gather inspiration for artwork and for fabric designs. And I can say I may, may have purchased some of her fabric designs and they're uh, fantastic. So I'm going to hand over now to Deb to uh, speak to you about her fellowship. Well, thank you very much, Adam. And uh, thank you so much, Paul. That was fascinating. Um, I must say that this whole experience of being a Churchill Fellow is, like you say, life-changing. So I am a, a fabric designer. I'm an ecological activist. I'm a plant advocate and a professional printmaker from Tasmania. Um, my work is highly detailed, it's intimate, it creates a window into the botany of Tasmania's wild plant communities and our shared cultural history. Um, my personal specimen collection I've gathered over 30 years to create rich layered and complex botanical designs on fine fabric and wallpapers and in limited edition fine prints using digital dry point and monoprint um, <coughs> techniques. I'm a graduate from the Canberra School of Art, um, so I'll be coming back there one day soon. And I teach printmaking in my Hobart studio. Um, advocating for Tasmania's wild and endangered botany to protect threatened species and valuable ecological, historical and cultural environments 
is an important part of my work. I was a key member in the Research Bay campaign to protect the, um, the landing place that the French, where the French created a, a, a garden in the 1790s. Um, and it was, a, it was a pivotal time, which made me realize the work that I'm doing has great value if I can lift it into this other sphere. I didn't know how to do that, but I, I wondered if I might be able to apply for a Churchill Fellowship and uh, lo and behold, I did. Um, the, Don de Cast the French Don de Casto expedition documented that landscape in the 1790s, gathering really important first scientific collections. Um, so my Churchill Fellowship, ah, oh, actually I should have my screen. I was just waiting for a moment to just check if you were gonna share your slides. Yeah, sorry about that. That's Oops. right. It's going great without them, don't worry. Screen share. Um, and then what? I'm sharing it. Can you see that? No. Oh, I'm not very good with this, am I? Screen share. Um, oh, here we are. Yep, perfect. Right. So that's me. And then here I go again. <laughs> So my, um, my Churchill Fellowship to study the early French botanical collections from Tasmania held in herbarium collections in Europe um, was extraordinary because it became like my life mirror, mirroring um, this history, going back to look at these early collections um, that were really important, but quite hidden away. Um, so really what I wanted to do was um, begin to democratize these early collections that mean so much to me um, because I've lived in the landscape in Loon River for 20 years next to that type specific type locality where they were collected from doing this artwork of the plant collections and the printmaking you can see some on the silk behind me here um, to showcase these stories of the early um, naturalist and collectors and to bring forward some of these stories to help highlight conservation issues on the ground now, um, which are impacting these, um, these threatened species. So the Churchill Fellowship really gave me a vehicle to value myself, value the artwork and my lived experience that I bring to travel, which I'd never been able to do um, because I did live in a very isolated uh, region and, uh, and hence, you know, I'd found it hard to raise the money to travel, but um, it gave me a way to, to really look deeper into this hidden historical record tucked away in museum collections and to bring it forward in a new way. Now, I've been using my fabric designs and film content and now writings to sort of pull threads out of this historical narrative about the interconnection of cultures and to connect people back into the natural world um, and into conservation outcomes on the ground. And that's my, um, that's my cunning plan in, in developing the work that I have been able to since going to these museums in, uh, in Europe. So with the knowledge that I gained from studying in these herbarium collections, I'm hoping to sort of to reframe a culturally significant collection for contemporary use and make these collections and the work that I'm doing um, with this botany more highly visible and wearable to foster a deeper and a more personal engagement with our cultural science and with art. Um, how about we go to another one? So here we are. This slide shows you the, um, the web herbarium in Florence on the left. Fantastic herbarium. Uh, it's like a collection of collections. Um, in the middle is the Q Herbarium in London, and on the right is um, some of the Jardin de Plantes um, Natural History Museum in Paris. So I got to study the early French collections of La Balladiere, um, who made really important uh, discoveries, um, um, botanical, zoological records, uh, amazing maps, um, you know, so, so much else that that was collected from here and has informed our history um, since then. But I never thought that I'd be able to, to look at the actual type specimen collections 
that um, that I had access to for over a week here. So, you know, my Churchill Fellowship, what I found was it has clarified my focus for my artistic practice and crystallised my vision for the future work that I'm doing, preparing me for the work I'm doing today and the grant applications that I later applied for. I'd never applied for anything. In fact, the Churchill Fellowship was really it started as a terrifying ordeal, but it ended up being the best value I could put myself to do to crystallise my ideas to a point where I could present them um, at interview, along with many examples of my work. It was um, it was hair raising and so necessary for um, to give me the the knowledge of what I'm doing today. So. I travelled to these places and I'll just, um, yeah, so here I have a great thing about being a Churchill Fellow is the support and validation in valuing my own contribution to the advocacy for national and international cultural historical landscape and collections held overseas. The supportive and diverse community that I've met who value the art and the science of the creative work I am bringing to light has been so so helpful, so validating. So I bought um, to my Churchill interview, I bought samples of the work I make and of where I collect it from, of who I wanted to meet, presentations I'd prepared and uh, a keen enthusiasm for the field of interest that I have. And, and I knew that I could add greatly to this body of knowledge in Australia about the cultural historical record because I'd, I'd lived in this field and sought and had strove to protect it as part of a community campaign and that I could bring a modern context in textile design into this, um, this research field. Here, here you see me in the, um, the web herbarium. And on the left there are the bales of, um, of herbarium collections, type specimen collections from 1791 and 90, 92 and 93 in Research Bay from all of the, the from Western Australia and across to Tasmania. And there you see one of the type specimen collections of Stylidium, um, a beautiful plant and the field notes written by Labelladiere. Um, there you see Dr. Chiara Nepi, who helped me immeasurably um, have access to this collection. Um, it was extraordinary access. Um, I went from here to the. Um, I went from here to the. Uh, oh no! Here we have some of the, some of the very inspiring pieces that I wanted you to see. The notes, um, the um, engravings, some of the, um, the stamps of the different herbarium, um, bodies that are on the the Bodan and the, uh, La Baladier collections. And here is some of the engravings and the, the proofs that were um, drawn on and annotated by La Baladier to be sent back to the printmakers. So, you know, extraordinary um, access that I had in there. And as a printmaker, I just find this so juicy and so helpful and the, the paper that it was printed on at the time. So I couldn't have found this in Australia very easily and certainly not the, the immersion um, into this field. I was able to identify and find um, nine different specimens, nine different drawings on the plates that they didn't even know they had and they hadn't digitized. So they were really grateful that I'd come in and done this study um, because I was able to find these original field drawings. So typically I would uh, photograph the whole type specimen sheet, concentrate on the various elements, the labels, the pins, the tabs, securing the plants, the pages, the original notes, the seed envelopes, the, the drawings and the stamps, um, noting, noticing the placement of the pieces. And, um, you know, some of what I'm doing is reinterpreting these type specimen um, sheets for modern design onto fabric. Um, what I, uh, some of the people that I met on my Churchill Fellowship. So Jordan Goodman, uh, Dr. Jordan Goodman was a Sir Joseph Banks specialist. Um, he, 
I interviewed him because he was, um, I was really interested in the way that scientists could carry on conversations and share knowledge uh, and even reinstate entire collections while their nations were at war between Britain and France. And I thought that's a yeah, very uh, um, topical these days. Um, so we had some really great um, uh, uh, conversations. I must say at this point that I took a filmmaker with me on my Churchill Fellowship, um, Joe Shemesh. And this was, um, this was pivotal. This was really, really useful in the, the sharing of my knowledge of what I found through the film that we made called um, The Fabric of Botany, which you can find in the journal section on my website. And it's a 28 minute um, journey through my, my Churchill Fellowship. So it, it was very helpful there. In the slide four, you see the director of the Potager de Roi, which is the King's Garden next to Versailles, a teaching garden for, um, for a horticulturalist to spread out through Europe. Um, and even some of the seeds that came to Tasmania in the French garden uh, were sourced from um, the Potager de Roi. Um, down on the bottom, we have the La Petite Malmaison, which was owned by Empress Josephine. Um, and this, she grew some of the plants from Tasmania here. On pl uh, slide number three, there is um, uh, Dr. Mark Johnson, who is the curator at the uh, Jardin de Plants. You know, extraordinary access that I had to, um, to Baudin's collections and to uh, La Baladier's collections. People were very generous, even though I'd never gone into these, you know, great halls of fame. Here I am at the uh, Toile de Jouy Museum, the fabric of the day, uh, it's called, um, innovative and contemporary designs during the, the French Revolution, um, depicting scenes of the day. And so I'm interested in this um, as a field, depicting the scenes of the day today and what's at stake for these plants and these landscapes. So I've invested all of my skills, my researches and finances into the begin beginnings of a fabric and a wallpaper design collection, which showcased the wild and endangered flora of Tasmania, especially telling stories of plants collected by the early French naturalists to here. A major outcome has been the digitizing of my personal herbarium and printmaking herbarium for the high resolution element library, which I now use for all of my wallpaper and fabric designs. I'm now poised to start a company and protect my designs within my IP within that to sort the necessary licensing of the legal documents uh, to trade in a variety of international jurisdictions and search for industry partners to bring my botanical designs into fabric and wallpaper, referencing the early record from Tasmania. I built a new website for showcasing both of my, my fabric and artwork and to develop a rich storyline to deepen the understanding behind the flora and the early naturalists of Tasmania and Australia. I've successfully won four grants to produce a high-end short film showcasing my work called The Sartorial Naturalist, which will be available soon. It's with international um, film festivals. I've won a grant called New Work for New Markets, and I'm, I'm hoping to um, get the Export Market Development Grant to help pathways into new markets internationally um, to bring to work with industry partners to, to really highlight the flora of Tasmania and this rich cultural record and historical record. I'm about to have seven and a half minutes on Gardening Australia um, on which I, in which I talk about this. And really I'm wanting to bring people, to seduce people through fabric and delightful silk into this really interesting shared knowledge and shared collections. So since I've been back, I've given numerous Oh, but nine presentations to different groups or institutions, many radio interviews on local and national radio about my Churchill Fellowship and its value to my arts practice. I've contributed to about eight magazines and online magazine articles. Um, I've, with Joe Shemesh, made The Fabric of Botany, the, uh, about my Churchill experience, which has been shown many, many times. Um, the Sartorial Naturalist film, which I'll be able to, you'll be able to access through my website as soon as it's available. Um, many exhibitions and, and I realized the responsibility of um, talking about what the Churchill Fellowship means and the trust that is um, held by them in me and my arts practice, which was so validating and so very helpful. So 
you know, there are many ways in which um, I get to talk about my, uh, my journey and, and where it's helped me. One of the amazing things that I did while I was away was I found my father's um, botanical specimens in Kew Herbarium from the 1955-56 Gough Island Scientific Survey, um, plus a plant named after him. Now, you know, this was quite extraordinary to me, to, to the similarities of his interests to the early French naturalists, their work in remote locations and to the collections which I'm making and studying made me feel really linked in a very special way to the, the joys and adventures of plant collecting and its use in habitat protection. So um, I suppose in between, um, so in the application, I sought a lot of help from friends. I had never applied for anything this big. Um, it was a bit terrifying, but it actually turned into uh, to be something so useful for my future and so useful for bringing, bringing something out that I thought, well, maybe only I can do in this way. Um, so I, help, I asked for friends for help with research and report writing. I learned so much about um, the tech involved. Um, beginning that correspondence with major international lending institutions to ascertain what was needed, the protocols and the upcoming events I may attend or present at. I asked help from professionals where I didn't know what to do. And, um, and honestly, people were so happy to, to help me. And I now feel like I'm giving back um, in loads what they gave to me. So it does take a fair amount of time and commitment being a Churchill Fellow. I've put considerable time into presentations and media and talks about my fellowship. Um, there is a lot of interest in the field. And because I'm a, a performer and a visual artist, there's a, that added element of the, the new work that I'm bringing forward. But the Churchill Fellowship has really contributed so greatly to my life and my career. I don't mind doing this in the least um, because I know that this was the first step on me really valuing what I can bring and how to develop interest. And I know that um, this, uh, it's also helped me to understand the huge collaboration and the creative collaborations that are um, held within the film industry and what a subversive way, uh, what a subversive um, means is art and music and film to get across a message. And I really thank the Churchill Trust for putting their trust in me to take a filmmaker with me to understand um, that I can do that, um, learn that process. And now I'm using it in a much more um, available way. And, and I hope to um, bring a great deal of richness into the cultural, historical and uh, a fabric life of Australia and, um, and broach some, some, some connections. And, you know, hopefully I may be employing people in the future. And it's a, it's a way to bring someone out of, you know, quite obscurity in, uh, in the wilds to aspire to really adding to, into Australian culture and linking it with the French and the untold record. Um, of these early French explorers. So I would really um, advise you to go for it. Go crystallize your ideas, write them down, find some really good referees. Um, think about how you might use film or um, drawing or the tech that you can take, you know, some of the, um, the, the mind mapping ideas to, to, to hold on to all the information that you find as you go, because it's a whirlwind. And like Adam said, you do need to factor in some downtime just to um, assimilate all this knowledge. But the ways that you can help yourself in collecting that as you go, they're very important to learn and embed before you actually take off. Because once you're there, everything is so new. I'd never traveled overseas as an adult. It was terrifying, but it was so fantastic. And, um, and I've just gone ahead in leaps and bounds since then. So thank you for the opportunity. I really hope that you um, trust yourself enough to start this process and apply for a Churchill Fellowship because it will change your life. Awesome. Thank you, Deb. That was, that was excellent. Um, inspiring to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and thanks again, Paul. So um, thanks everyone who's stayed on, which is um, most of the participants. Uh, 
got some pretty juicy questions, which is uh, really good. So I'll quickly go through them, conscious we're into some people's lunch time. Is it possible to view uh, previous successful applicants' uh, applications? Um, no, not, well, I say no, um, we don't have them available for you to view. You can certainly um, read their reports and you can get in touch with any Churchill Fellow um, to go to our website and you find an interesting fellow and, and project, uh, you, there's a contact request form. You can fill that out and we, we can try and put you in touch with that fellow. And they, um, I'm almost certain that as a Churchill Fellow, they'd be quite happy to talk to you about their application and, and, and how they went about it. Um, we also have alumni associations in each state and territory. So on the homepage of our website, scroll down the bottom, you'll see a map of Australia and you can also get in touch with um, a Churchill Fellows Association in your state or territory and that will give you a chance to talk to some Churchill Fellows and, and get, maybe ask them some questions about the applications. Nerid has asked, uh, could you tell us about a range of examples of fellowships already granted in the creative arts? just to help you understand uh, more of what the possibilities are. Well, uh, gladly, um, first I'll just say, if, again, go to our website. There's a uh, main menu called Projects and Fellows. You can then um, click on that and uh, you can search via topic, select um, the arts and search, and it'll come up with um, like heaps and heaps and all the fellows we've awarded in the arts. But honestly, the sky's the limit. So um, historical violin performance, uh, fine art, printmaking, to research the unique creative processes and relationships between a choreographer and their composer, Japanese uh, kintsugi, uh, glass blowing, puppetry, sculpture, drumming, botanical dyes, makers and creators, uh, trades, shoemaking, the list goes on. Um, honestly, uh, we welcome uh, applications from any uh, aspect of the arts. So please um, hope that encourages you. Um, Music, yes, Natalie, that is what we all like to see too. Um, in terms of other costs associated with the project, um, are translation services or language interpreter costs appropriate to be included? Yes, you can You can put that request in as a, a fee request in your application. Um, there have been instances, obviously, where that, that's been quite um, important uh, and we can support that. Um, are fellowships limited depending on your location? So I'm going to interpret that as meaning depending on which state or territory you reside in, um, or Norfolk Island, uh, you may be there. Um, they're, they're limited in the sense that we obviously allocate proportionally based on the population, a number of fellowships, um, but quite often the smaller states punch above their weight. Um, and usually that's because we have these sponsor fellowships are referred to and quite often um, they'll get more than proportionally you might have thought they would. So. Um, limited only really by the, the natural fall of the population with a chance for smaller states to get a few more than you'd expect. I hope that answers that question. Um, what is the period between submitting the initial application when a general itinerary is acceptable to the time when a more substantial itinerary is expected? Um, at the shortlist, um, or interview stage or thereafter. So look, just in, in summary, your application should be quite a tight itinerary saying, I wanna to go to this country, this city or town um, to meet this organization or this person for this period of time. And you need to map that out. Um, you'll be interrogated, I guess, asked about that at interview. We wanna understand you know, more about why you wanna go there, what you hope to find. Um, once you're awarded a fellowship, there's a little bit of scope to alter your itinerary, but you can't suddenly add, you know, three weeks in New York, because that cost is, is massively different to what we would have expected. So um, be realistic about your itinerary, where you want to go, how long you want to go. Um, naturally, there may be a few tweaks that you need to make um, before you, you uh, travel off on your fellowship. Uh, can you film interviews as part of a documentary uh, on a topic that will help Australians? Yes, you can. And you heard from Deb, she took someone with her. We have a camera that we've loaned to fellows as well. Um, so Tom Forrest, you can search him up on, on our website. He um, did his fellowship looking at medicinal cannabis and he's produced a fantastic video. And he, he took uh, the camera with him uh, that we loaned him to do that. So look, if you've got the skills and the creativity, uh, we'd love to see uh, you know, videos and, and someone's uh, done a podcast 
And in fact, uh, we've had a video and a podcast submitted as a report. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a written report if you've got the skills to communicate um, to your audience uh, really well, uh, other than through a written report, we would welcome uh, exploring that with you as well. Um, someone's asked if you can apply for currently starting a PhD, but we'll put that on hold to focus on the project. It might be in the same field, but something you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Yeah, absolutely. That, that sounds perfectly fine. I mean, as long as it's not specifically what your PhD is on and you're just going to use that as an adjunct or a supplement to your PhD, that we don't have a problem with that at all. And, and if you're going to put it on hold, I think that sounds pretty sensible because it'd be pretty hard to juggle a PhD and a Churchill uh, fellowship at the same time, I would imagine. Um, what output at the end of a fellowship is expected? So anything beyond the report? Well, yes, absolutely. So um, we don't want you to say, and we'll ask you this in application, oh, look, um, I will get an, a journal article because that's not really sufficient. What we're looking for is, is a bit more from you. So um, think about how you're going to share your findings, your knowledge, uh, what things you'll do to, to get it out there. And that, look, the sky's the limit once again. You know, people do media interviews, people have created, you know, entire websites, people have, have done all sorts of things. And in some cases, you won't know until you've done a fellowship what it is that you'll do. But um, uh, what we expect you to do is to come back and, and try and um, do something with your findings. You'll notice on my background that says impact um, funding. This is a new initiative we've just opened where we're offering additional funding for fellows um, on their return from their fellowship uh, to help them implement their findings. And we also have some funding available for fellows uh, to help them disseminate their findings. So we're really all about don't just you know, come back from your fellowship, submit a report and get on with um, other things. We expect you to continue to um, pursue uh, ways of sharing and implementing your learnings. Um, someone's asked if they're eligible to apply if they're going overseas in November this year. Um, and while over there begin their fellowship activity in March. Uh, look, that, that, that can be okay. That doesn't change your eligibility to apply. Um, if you're already over there, uh, I think that's okay. The main thing is that you're going to come back to Australia and that, that's what we want to hear and that you're going to share that um, knowledge when you come back. So I think that should be okay, Jenna. Um, is doing workshops, uh, say personalised workshops to work on a new show, for instance, an acceptable, acceptable thing to apply for? Um, look, I, I'm not fully understanding what, you mean by that but I think yes that does actually sound perfectly fine if you're wanting to use your church or fellowship to go overseas meet with people undertake workshops so they're going to inform um, a new show that you're going to do that sounds fantastic um, and can you please talk a little bit about oh hi Saskia a little bit about uh, what's expected for the report so really what we expect if you're going to write a report is, um, well, I'll tell you what we don't expect. And what I don't like to see is a big long bibliography. And it looks like you just went to the local library or sat in your lounge room on Google. What we want to see is, you know, a description of um, what, what it is that you wanted to explore, where you went, who you met with, what you observed, what you learnt, and then your thoughts about, you know, how could that be applied back here in Australia with some, you know, recommendations about what could be done in Australia to implement what you learnt overseas. So it's really is that simple. Um, we don't expect it to be, you know, 100 plus pages. It doesn't have to be super detailed. And as I mentioned before, um, if you want to do something creative, uh, it doesn't have to be just a written report. It could be um, something a bit more engaging depending on your, your topic and, and your skill set. And uh, Maria has asked, in terms of gaining new skills, is it acceptable to include attendance at multi-day workshops. Yeah, look, absolutely. So I think um, that's something we don't see as much of as perhaps we could is that the uh, Church of Fellowship can be used to go and learn new skills and that could be attending uh, specific workshops or undertaking uh, you know, some particular training and, and that's absolutely fine. So what you need to do is get a sense of the cost of doing that and include that in your uh, application. So that's, that's quite important as well. A um, couple more questions. Uh, is the definition of countries, uh, in the definition of countries, does the UK include Wales and Scotland uh, from England or are they, no, we sort of, uh, UK is, is pretty broad. So, um, uh, but you'll get the chance to, in the application form, um, 
there's a drop down list and you're about to find the countries in there. Um, and can you speak more about referees? Uh, yes, so ultimately you need, you need two referees. You need one referee who's someone that can talk about um, you as a person, you know, uh, basically how, you know, selling you, why you're the right person to do this. So they might say, look, the, this applicant I've known for some time, I've seen that they're really passionate about this issue, they've been working really hard on this, for, you know, for, for several years, whatever the case may be, um, and, and that, you know, I've seen them uh, deliver on the things that they say they'll do, et cetera, et cetera. And then the second referee needs to be someone who has some credibility in your field. Um, and so, you know, they don't necessarily have to be Australia's leading expert, but certainly someone that um, our, our selectors could, could call up if they need to and actually um, get a sense of, um, is this topic really, you know, what they, how they've portrayed it? Um, you know, usually what's written in the reference is enough for us, but um, it needs to be someone with some credibility on that particular issue, either through their work or through their, their other experience. Um, so I hope that helps there. Um, just to reiterate that point, get onto your referees nice and early, make sure they are around over the next few weeks and have time to write your reference for you. And just one last question. Um, is spending eight weeks training under an internationally renowned acting coach to get accredited into her method and bring it back to Australia something it's okay to apply for? Um, on the surface, yes, absolutely. Sounds like uh, possibly a really good use of a Churchill Fellowship. Um, only four people in Australia are currently accredited to teach this method and none in your home state. So look, on the surface, that sounds um, perfectly acceptable for an application. Um, and I've missed a question, thank you. Where's that question? Okay, is it acceptable to contribute the knowledge skills from your research to an already planned exhibition in Australia? Oh, I, I don't see why not. I think if it adds, um, you know, value uh, from that knowledge you learned overseas that otherwise you wouldn't have been able to get in Australia, then that sounds um, quite, quite good. So. Thank you, um, Vitae, for your assistance. Um, and do the referees need to be uh, an Australian? Look, not necessarily. Um, I think sometimes experts in, in some niche areas maybe don't reside in Australia, so that, that can be acceptable if, if they're not Australian or living in Australia. Um, and does the expert referee need to know you professionally? No, not necessarily. I think that's why we have the personal referee and I guess the, the expert referee we're relying on them to talk knowledgeably about the issue that you're proposing to do. So they may not need to know you personally. Okay, well, that's all the questions. Um, look, if you've got any more questions, feel free to call us here at the office or email us um, or attend another session that won't be necessarily on the arts, but um, it will still be an opportunity to ask questions. So um, thanks everyone for your attendance today and good luck. <laughs>